to have you all here together around God's word and around Christ's body and blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So welcome to all of you here today as uh, God brings us together 
to be part of his family, uh, to be fed by him and his son. Um, also, special welcome to any guests and visitors here with us this morning. If you are joining us uh, and, and are not familiar with Good Shepherd and what we teach, especially in regards to communion, you can take a look at the front of your bulletin, uh, which if you need some, they're right on the table out in the gathering area in the narthex there, and that's what we teach according to Scripture regarding the Lord's Supper. So if you're uh, curious as to what we teach, believe, and confess about that, you can find that on the front of our bulletins there. Uh, today we continue in our sermon series, though, as we've been going through the book of Philippians, and uh, last week hopefully you read through chapter 2 of Philippians uh, and, and fi- found some encouragement and comfort Uh, and and, uh, exhortation from St. Paul in chapter 2 of Philippians. But here this week we start um, learning about Philippians chapter 3 and what the Lord has for us uh, in that chapter of Scripture. So I pray God's blessings upon you this day uh, and hope that you uh, find some encouragement from Philippians chapter 3. We also have uh, a few other exciting things today. We'll have the children come up during... Uh, the offering time to uh, have a musical offering uh, of song to the Lord uh, during during the offering time. And um, also it's great to have worship team here uh, together this morning. I think that's all we have for announcements regarding uh, worship this morning. So blessings upon you and great to have you here. Let us join together in singing our opening hymn, O Church Arise. Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we pause to reflect on that unrighteousness and reflect to God in meditation. O Almighty God, a merciful Father, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and I sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me and a poor sinful being. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And it's for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing together. pray. Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love, and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And here we see a metaphor of the Lord talking about how he has planted a vineyard, that one day he will come and redeem all the fruit of that vineyard, and yet there will be people who oppose him. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson today is from Philippians chapter 3, 4b to 14. Here. Can you guys hear me? Ooh, okay, we're still good. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, 
of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, pressing on toward the goal. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able out of reverence for the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, and he dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time had approached, he sent his servants to to the tenants to collect the fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one. They killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders had rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and at this time, the children are welcome to come forward for a children's message. You swallowed your gum? (laughs) Thanks for telling me. (laughs) Seven years later, we'll find it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Welcome, everyone. It is so good to see you. Yeah, come on up here, Hallie. That's great. Callum, can you scoot over a little bit for your sister? Nolan, can you scoot over? Great. Perfect. Awesome. Right there. Oh, wow. You have really red sparkly shoes. Those look great. Well, it is so good to see you all here this morning. How many of you are a little sleepy this morning? Yeah, yeah. But guess what? When you woke up, was there a prize waiting for you when you woke up in breakfast? Raise your hand if you had breakfast this morning. 
Yeah, breakfast is such a great prize that we get to have when we wake up in the morning. Maybe when you get ready for bed, raise your hand if you have a nighttime snack before you go to bed. Yeah, that's like a prize right before you get to go to bed, isn't it? When you run, if you run a race, if you run a race, or if you do something spectacular, like if you win the Super Bowl or the NBA championship, what's the prize that you get at the end of a race or the end of a Super Bowl? What's the prize that you get? A trophy. Yeah, you get a trophy and money usually too. Yeah, yeah. Some people, when they win the Super Bowl, they get to say, I'm going to Disney World. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's a cool prize, isn't it? Yeah, so there are lots of prizes that you and I have in this, in this life. Yeah, if you get a good grade on one of your pieces of homework, what's the prize that you get for doing your homework? Maybe you get like a big gold star or the letter A with a plus sign next to it, and it shows that you did a really good job. But does Jesus ever give us a prize Have you ever thought about that? What's the prize that you get for being a follower of Jesus, for believing in Jesus? Ah, Callum, that is awesome. Can you come give me a high five? Woo, that is great. Did you guys hear what Callum said? He says that the prize that Jesus gives you and me and your mom or your dad or your brothers or your sisters for believing in him and following him, the prize is heaven. That's what St. Paul tells us in our epistle reading when he says, I press on towards the, the prize, that upward call that Jesus has for me, that is heaven word. That's awesome, Callum. Jesus has a prize for each of you boys and girls that is in heaven. It's eternal life with him in the new heavens and the new earth. So you can look forward by going to Sunday school, by praying with your parents, by reading the Bible, by believing in Jesus, that Jesus has a prize for you in the race of faith that you get to run. So I'm going to give Jesus to one of you guys here today, um, and you can take him home. Um, is it Etta? Is your, what's your name again? Bryn. Bryn. Oh, is your sister's name Etta? Ivy, not even close. Bryn, you can take Jesus home with you, and I've got a sheet that explains what you can do with Jesus uh, as you take him home for the next month. But before that, boys and girls, why don't we pray to God and talk to him about the prize that he has for us. So fold your hands, close your eyes, and if you're in the pew, you can pray along with us too. Repeat after me. Dear God, God, thank you you. for saving us us. and and giving to us the prize of eternal life. life. Keep it safe in heaven heaven. while we work here on earth earth. for you you. and for our neighbors. neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you can head back to your seats and Bryn, you can come take Jesus and you get to have him for a, a whole month and take him home and spend time with him, okay? All right, and we will continue by singing our hymn of the day, O Church Arise.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How would you respond if I were to say this phrase? The Lord be with you. Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Give yourselves a pat on the back. This one's a little bit more common. If I were to say, Christ is risen. Oh, oh, come on, come on. Only half of you did the hallelujah. That's the best part. That's the best part. That's God saying, God save us. Let's try that again. Christ is risen. He is risen hallelujah. Great. Yes, that is so great. It's great when we are all united in saying that together. It gives us all encouragement when I say, the Lord be with you, and you say, and also with you, I actually am enlightened by you. Sometimes uh, when I'm with other pastors and they, uh, we have a ser- worship service together and they say, the Lord be with you, sometimes pastors will go like this back to the pastor who's presiding and say, and also with you, and it's like, oh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> we mean it. We mean it. The Lord be with you. The very God of heaven and earth, the one who was sent into this world in Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to save us from a world that's caving in on itself. I want that Lord to be with you. We're not only united in what we say, though, when we say those words. It unites us in what we think and what we do. And that means that by what we say, it shapes what we think and what we do in the church. And when we are united in what we say, think, and what we do, it's quite amazing, and the world tends to take notice of it. Whether it's for good or for bad, the world tends to take notice of the church when it is united in what it says thinks, and does. Last week in our sermon series, uh, in reading through Philippians chapter 2, we found how God unites us together in the mind of Christ Jesus as we are partners in the gospel. We were encouraged to live out the life of Jesus. Because in Jesus' mind, we are brought together in what we think and what we say. And so what we do among one another in this place is transformed for the benefit and encouragement of one another. But it's not just in this place that Philippians brings our attention to. We are also encouraged to live out the life of Jesus, not only among each other here in this congregation, but also out in the world. I certainly have noticed your thoughts, the way that you think, the way that you speak, and what you do for one another. From the unity that you all have in Jesus Christ, I've, I've, I've seen that. And I think that uh, this week as I was reading through Philippians, and, and I actually listened to it uh, more so than I, than I read it in my head. Sometimes I'll read it out loud. Um, but this week I found myself uh, just listening to it from someone else reading it. Uh, and, and I was brought to uh, tears of, of joy at times reading through Philippians. Because it reminded me of how St. Paul felt about those Philippian Christians and what I've seen in what you think, say, and do to one another and for one another. In chapter 1 of Philippians, St. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrances of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership. In the gospel. I mean, could you imagine if that's how pastors continually talked about you, the people of God, that we are thankful for you 
because you believe in Jesus, how much joy we have from you. And that's not only where St. Paul stops, because in chapter 2, St. Paul calls the Philippian Christians, my beloved. I don't know if you've ever had your spouse call you beloved, um, but if they ever call you that, maybe you'll be taken aback for a little bit. <laughs> but I encourage you to think about it. St. Paul calls his fellow Christians his beloved the ones that he, he is to love and cherish above all other things in the world. And here in chapter 3, St. Paul calls his Philippian Christians brothers three times. Now, that's not to, inc- not to exclude the sisters in the faith. He, typically, he would say brothers because it was kind of a universal way of saying everyone calls them brothers three times. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to my brothers, the three brothers that I do have, um, uh, sometimes we get in disagreements, but we always work through those disagreements, despite how much we've hurt one another. Because we know that first and foremost, we are brothers in Christ. See, that's the kind of unity that we have that we were shown in chapter 2. That we are, when we are partners in the gospel, we are brought into the mind of Jesus and we have a unity here in this place that already exists in God's Son, Jesus. When St. Paul acknowledges the partnership in the gospel that they have with him, St. Paul is encouraged not only by them, but he points them to how they can encourage one another in their partnership, that he encourages his life and ministry, but they now have hope to stand together when Paul is not around and things don't go right. I mean, you know how it goes with siblings. There are times when things just don't go right. And chapter 3 of Philippians brings us outside of the walls of the church where we know that unity is found in Jesus. And chapter 3 brings us outside of the church to where we see people struggle to find unity. Instead of finding phrases out in the world like the Lord be with you and Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia, now we find phrases plastered to bumper stickers that are posted on signs that are pitched in the front yards of people. You can find and look at a smattering of phrases that people will post online for anybody and everybody to see. Oftentimes, some of these phrases show how people yearn for unity and cohesion among communities, among families, or even our House of Representatives and our government. And that's a good hope. It's a good hope when you hear a phrase like this, which maybe you can finish. United we stand, divided divided we fall. But as far as I can tell, and maybe from your own perspective and observation of the world, the unity that is found here on earth among all of humanity often feels like one step forward and then five steps backward. It may seem like people are pressing forward for one moment, but then the next moment it feels like everybody is at each other's throats screaming at each other from keyboards and protected on screens all over. Even the labels that we give to one another get at this tension of united we stand and divided we fall when we depict each other as progressive or conservative. It shows the struggle that sin has brought into the world that was never there before. What are we actually conserving if we are conservative? 
Is it good? Is it helpful? Or is it simply selfish and serving an end goal of what fits me best rather than my neighbor? And what about the progression that we are seemingly marching towards each year? Does it truly help people or does it simply cast people back to their own sinful desires and devices? United we stand, divided we fall. And where does the church stand? Is it in the land of progress or in the land of conservation. Well, when St. Paul speaks to us in Philippians chapter 3, he teaches us how we should live united as Christ's people in a divided world. St. Paul says, if anyone has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. If you have any confidence to say, I'm a pretty good person based on what you've done in your life, St. Paul is saying to you, I can beat you. <laughs> I can do better. <laughs> and the world often challenges each other like that, don't they? We often participate in that similar challenge. St. Paul says that he has more confidence in the flesh. He had the best family history. He was the best at conserving the traditions, the rules, the law and order among the world and the religious elite. He was so good at progressing that conservation of tradition and rule and law and order that it drove him to progress towards even persecuting the church of God. He was so on fire for what he thought was uniting the world that he couldn't see the division that was being brought by himself. You and I fail to help the divided world that we live in if we only live our Christian lives for ourselves. If all we ever live is our salvation in relationship to Jesus, we miss that he has come to save the very world that he created and divided, it will fall. We as the church stand both in the land of progress and conservation. In the divided world where Jesus has placed us as a beacon, it, it, it's like this. Uh, maybe you've driven sometimes during the night, which uh, Danielle and I were talking about last night, and she said, I really don't like driving anymore at, at night. And I said, yeah, we're getting old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the truth. We're working towards it day by day, just like everybody else. But maybe when you, you've driven at night... And, and you come over a hill, you can see uh, the light pollution from a city, and you're like, oh, yes, nice. I get to see finally again. Maybe it's a, a pause for hope because you finally get to take a bathroom break or a snack break so you can keep pushing on towards your end goal. That is what it is like to be the church, living united as the church in a divided world. The church needs to realize it is a beacon that Christ has created because he is the true light of the world and he makes his church shine brightly for the divided world. That's what it is like to live united in a divided world. Verse 14 says it this way. Paul takes the perspective of himself as an individual, and he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you see the progress that he uses in his life to make sure of what God has already made certain in his life? There is an end goal for his life. It is not just simply to come one hour each week to receive God's good benefits and then to forget about them 
the other hours of the day. The end goal of what we, the united people of God, are progressing towards is the prize for which God has prepared for us in Christ Jesus. Verses 10 and 11 say as much when St. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings and becoming like Him in His death. So that in some how, some way, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. When we are united in church, we are united to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we shine as a beacon for the world, because we're not dead. We're alive, for Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And if Christ is alive, so is the church. The church is alive here on earth. But the church is not just here alive on earth to progress towards its own salvation, ignoring the world. That's why we conserve things like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. It's why we practice praying together here at church so that when we are in our homes, when we are out and about, we can pray for our families and our friends, whether it's right there with them in the moment or it's just later on and they don't need to know about it. We can serve because by holding up what Christ has conserved for us through the apostles and those faithful people who came before us, that's how we progress towards what he has already won for us in Jesus Christ by his life, death, and resurrection. Somehow, I, I, I think sometimes we get it confused that we need to wait for what God has in store for us in heaven. And yet St. Paul is so certain of what he has. He says, I've already attained the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have obtained it here, but I already have it. Do you live as the church as if you were dead or alive? Are you progressing towards the salvation of God only for yourself or for the hope of the world? Jesus did not simply come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You are the many, and there are many more whom he gave his life as a ransom for. So you already have attained the resurrection of the dead. When you come and you take communion here, you are going to be revived to new life again because you will receive Jesus' body and blood, which is not dead but is alive. So you need not fear death, sickness, pain, changing policies, or even division in the world itself because, as St. Paul reminds us, our citizenship is in heaven first and foremost. And then we are citizens of this world. So whatever is your profit in this life, whether it's great or small, whether it's status in this life, or whether it's hardly any influence at all, Count it worthless for the sake of loving Jesus. Chapter 3 of Philippians brings us as the church of Christ Jesus out into the world that says, united we stand, divided we fall. But by our actions that come from Christ, by our speech that comes from Christ, by our thoughts that come from Christ, it is. Our life does not revolve around the worldly unity that sets its mind on earthly things. But rather, in verse 16, St. Paul tells us, let us live up to what has already been attained for us. So let's live together in the world. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding keep and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. 
Amen. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith united together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We say it together. I believe in one God, the Father, of maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the church, the vineyard of the Lord's planting, that he nurture us, his church, with the means of grace and that we bring forth fruits in keeping with the kingdom of God. Let us pray to the Lord. For the nations, that those who lead us heed the word of God and pre preserve us from all threats to our faith and promote virtue and goodness in all we say and do. Let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, that we not take for granted all that the Lord has given us and work to bear the good fruit of his kingdom in our lives together and individually. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and all who suffer in body, mind, or soul, especially for Mike Newen, Ron Rogers, Paul and Naomi During, the family of Jane Close as they mourn her death, grant them peace and comfort and encouragement. For Michelle Wren, for Spencer Thorsland, for Mark Peterson, Evelyn Bulky, Addie Mork, Bob Taylor, Donna Cruz, Luca Hausman, Judy Shorter, Leon Wonderlich, John D. Mike McDaniel, Pastor Don Wilkie, and for Cheryl Corson, Corson as she continues to recover. We also give you thanks, Lord, for the union of Tyler Betterman and Shannon, Shannon Mail, that they would be preserved in their marriage and would be able to glorify you in all that they do as husband and wife. Lord, grant all whom we have lifted up to you now patience in any affliction, comfort in any pain, and grace to be sustained now into everlasting life in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who approach the, this altar today, that they be prepared through repentance and faith to receive this sacrament for their good, and that what they receive may bear good fruit in their lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Almighty and everlasting God, ever more ready to hear than we are to pray, grant to us all good things needful to us, and keep from us all things harmful, that we may not enter into judgment. Keep us from pleading only our righteousness, and cover us with grace, that we may wear the righteousness of Christ by faith, and so labor within your vineyard, and receive the crown of everlasting life in Christ. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. And at this time, we will collect our tithes and our offerings as uh, the elders and ushers come forward. The children are welcome to come forward too at this time as they prepare to sing a song.
All right, boys and girls, you can head back to your seats. Great job. That was wonderful. Good job. We receive an offering at this time. God has graciously blessed us with all things that are needful for our bodies and our souls, and so we return back to him what he has so graciously blessed us with in our lives. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and mighty Lord, we give you thanks for having made all things and for your patient mercy in dealing with us sinners who deserve nothing of your kindness. Grant us grace in Christ that all our sins be forgiven and that we be covered with the righteousness of Christ and may worthily approach this table of our Lord today and in eternity be welcomed into the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which is without end. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
stand as you are able. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on this day, uh, on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, ironically, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. <laughs> Just a few announcements uh, before we head off to where God calls us to stand up for Christ. Um, there will be no chosen Bible study uh, this evening, so if you're planning on attending that, wait till the, the next week to uh, attend for that. Also, uh, the Young Adult Bible Study for Divine Drama, if you're still interested in attending that, you certainly can. Uh, they started last week, but it's going every other week, so you'll need to pick up next week at 3 p.m. for the Young Adult uh, Bible study if you're interested in joining that, which uh, you can always jump in on at any time. So that uh, will also be next Sunday. Um, <clears throat> also on October 15th uh, will be a Sunday school teacher and elder installation. So if you're a Sunday school teacher uh, or a youth leader as well uh, or an elder, please, be, please try and be here uh, next week so we can have a good installation of, of you and praise God for uh, your upcoming work this year. Uh, also, uh, starting this Sunday, if you're interested in becoming a new member here, um, we will be having new member classes, uh, Faith Foundation class starting tonight at 7 o'clock in the library and lounge area. Um, are there any other announcements uh, this morning? Marion.
Great. So, so uh, a week from Tuesday is uh, Alter Guild. If you're interested in learning how all of this gets set up for Sunday, uh, or if you'd like to serve the church and God and your neighbors in that way, we'd love to have you. Uh, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. That's the 17th. Is that correct? Okay, great. So 6.30, uh, October 17th. Any other announcements? Okay, just uh, one, one last announcement, or two last announcements from myself. Uh, Dart Ball starts Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Good Shepherd is playing Zion at Zion Lutheran Church. So if you're interested in being a part of the Dart Ball team, um, uh, we will be starting on Tuesday at 7 p.m. over at Zion. Uh, you're welcome to come and join us and throw some darts, which is really fun. Um, <clears throat> And I can connect you with uh, the team leader uh, if, you, if you are interested in that and have never been a part of it before. Uh, also, next Saturday is the LWML Fall Rally at Zion, which will be a great presentation on mental health awareness and talking about uh, through some issues around that. So that, if you're interested in signing up for that, uh, it's $10, but there's also a sign up uh, in the Narthex if you're interested in going to that as well. Uh, last but not least, uh, there's two other things you can sign up to help out with. We've got our uh, Good Shepherd rummage sale coming up if you'd like to donate goods or if you'd like to help set up tables or serve um, goodies at the, at the bake sale as well. There's lots of opportunities to serve there. And then also our trunk or treat is coming up at the end of the month. So plan your fun uh, car idea for your trunk and treat. Uh, and also if you can bring some goodies uh, to be passed out to the community, that would be fantastic as well. So uh, with that, go in peace and serve the Lord and have a great day.